right now that you are not exactly a US citizen. Yeah, we are coming from France. And we have at least one joke about it. So why do you think that French people have so much trouble with the letter H? We are going to rely on your hip hop knowledge about that, okay? It's because we like to drop it like it's art, drop it like it's art, <laughs> drop it like it's art. <laughs> I got another one for you. Um, why do French people eat so much snails? Any idea? Because we don't like fast food. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like, if you don't mind, uh, we do. We are going to do a little bit of exercise. So if you just please do like that, just to check if uh, your arms are working properly. Uh, okay. Perfect. Okay, okay, so. In the room, if you could raise your hand, if you are more on the business side of the data, product management, strategy. Okay, All perfect. Right, we are a lot today. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to present to you Philippe, uh, Philippe Leonard. So Philippe is a digital transformer. So it does not mean that he transforms into a car or a truck. Uh, uh, he has a pretty cool title. But it, it simply means that Philippe is one of the key players of the digital transformation at Michelin. All right, now my turn to have you a bit uh, working out. So who in the room is uh, uh, delivering data for the business, uh, making a data platform available for the business, delivering data analytics and all that stuff? Okay, well, there are more. Ah. So uh, please welcome Fabien. Fabien is one of the key players at Michelin when it comes to making uh, data and data products available for business. So he is our, uh, he is our guy. Um, before digging into the share of our experience, um, we'd like Philippe to challenge you a little bit about your Michelin knowledge. No pressure. There are only 300 people in the room. Uh, it's filmed, so we're okay. So, Philip, can you give me one common point between UPS and Michelin? Uh, by UPS, you mean Union Parcel Services? Yes, sir. That very old US company uh, delivering uh, products uh, you buy on Amazon to uh, customers? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Maybe they are all Databricks customers? Probably. Um, need to check. Uh, no, in fact, it's a date, uh, so 1907. So in 1907, UPS has been created. Cool. Uh, but in the same time, in 1907, Michelin has bought its very first factory in the United States in New Jersey. So this shows that both the United States and Michelin are connected for more than a century. Or we could say that Michelin is a US company, almost. So let's move so, to some key figures. Um, so if you are not aware, uh, Michelin is uh, one of the top tire manufacturers in the world. We are more than 125 Michelin employees. We are having global footprint for more than, let's say, 24 billions of turnover in 2021. Um, in the recent year, we have crystallized our strategic approach into what we call the all sustainable approach. So we believe that in the future, by 2030, 2050, depending on the optimism or pessimism of the people, that everything that you are going to do at Michelin is going to be sustainable. And to make things sustainable, we need to, to be able to balance out three pillars. Uh, the people aspect, uh, we need to have our customer happy, that's our priority but also our employees, making sure that working at Michelin is providing a good experience, and also our partner in the business, our suppliers, for example, like Databricks. We need, of course, to uh, deliver our profit, we need to increase our turnover, have better margins, and so on, but all of that needs to be balanced out with uh, the fact that we need to have a planet, we need to have a, a proper environment to live in. And Michelin, in fact, did not wait uh, for the, the ecology to become a topic, to be interested in it. 
uh, our first energy, uh, energy uh, saver, so our tires who are targeting uh, low fuel consumption. In fact, we started developing them in the 90s. So it's, it's something that we are doing for quite a while now. Now, we have a little video uh, in order for you to, to get a better feeling about what it means, what Michelin means, and what you're trying to do. Wheels change the game for humankind. Our tires have revolutionized mobility, and our inventions have conquered the world. But today, competition is fierce, and high quality is becoming standard. We are innovating as much as ever, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to find customers willing to pay a fair price for our innovations. Still, our tire's potential is intact, and the expertise we have built over these 130 years gives us an edge. So let's be bold. Let's dare to be ourselves. Let's unleash the resources that are still hidden inside our tires. Let's create value with, around, and beyond tires. Of course, we already know how to provide our most demanding customers with tires that are constantly pushing performance to new heights, last longer, and are more connected. Tires that you can always expect more from. More respect for the soil to improve harvests. More grip to take safety to new levels. And more resistant tires that have better and longer performance, regardless of their size. Because we excel with materials. And our customers know it. The tyre revolution is still unfolding. Tomorrow's tyres will be puncture-proof, recyclable, self-regenerating and intelligent. Because we also know how to create value around tyres. We have been guiding everyone who travels by road since the very beginning. Today our tyres carry a wealth of information. We can use that information to create new services that make life easier for our customers. Take this truck, for example. Our tire is one of the connected objects on it. Our job is to turn that data into intelligence. That way we can offer our customers solutions in real time. And this truck is part of a fleet, so we're connecting all of its vehicles to optimize their operations. Our services make fleets more efficient, safer, cleaner, and more cost effective. We already have millions of connected objects around the world, and this is just the beginning. Lastly, we also know how to create value beyond tyres. Our core expertise, right from our origins, has been to unveil the secrets and materials to extract outstanding performance from flexible composites. So why limit that outstanding performance to our tyres when we can leverage it in other applications? We're already working on high-tech materials. Materials to take a new look at production and exchange. For example, our conveyor belts that can safely carry large amounts of resources over long distances anywhere. Materials to build tomorrow's sustainable cities. For example, our biosourced resins and all our other components that can be recycled endlessly to make architecture more planet-friendly. Materials to produce the energy of the future. For example, hydrogen, which will revolutionize the way we move and clean up cities. Materials and technical fabrics to conquer new frontiers. Pioneering is what we do and always have done. Innovating constantly to explore new growth territories with, around and beyond tires. So this is how Michelin wants to go, uh, wants to be moving forward over time. So three fields of activity, with tire, around tires, and beyond tires. So our core capacity is really on, uh, on uh, fabrication and manufacturing of tires. That's where our core competency is. But connecting those allows us to create a value stream around tires. And we are processing some key understanding on chemicals. Also, we have experience in mobility. We are uh, quite good in uh, um, managing hydrogen. So all of that are new fields of activity uh, beyond tires. So you got an overview of Michelin 2030 strategy. So to achieve this strategy, there is six level on which the group is relying. 
And I'm going to dig in the fifth one, which is the data-driven company. So the good question is, how do we become data-driven? First things, and obvious things, you need data. That's good news. We have plenty of it, thanks to our multiple IT system. But unfortunately, they are widely spread, so it's quite complicated to access to the data. We're also building data platforms and building data products on those platforms thanks to data mesh architecture principles. Data governance also helped us to identify the right data to expose first and the right products to build, thanks to roadmaps designed by our data owners. Finally, we all collectively change our mindset because we believe that data should be at the center of everything and it should be turned into value. So I'm going to explain uh, the, what is the data platform at Michelin, but before that, I'd like to explain you what is a platform. So a platform is nothing more than a place to meet, okay, for people or for services. It enables interactions between producers and consumers around what we're calling the core value unit. So the more value you have in your platform, the more popular is your platform if the content is easy to access, of course. And in platform, we are also seeing what we're calling vir virtual cycle or network effect. To illustrate this concept, I'd like to take an example of a famous platform, which is Uber. You probably use it. The key point of Uber platform is to connect people who need a ride and people who, can, who own a car and who are willing to drive them somewhere. The network effect on Uber is that, in fact, there is a lot of people in need of mobility. So by definition, the demand is high. And this attracts driver. So the more driver you have, the more value you have at the very end. And the magic about this platform is that it allows a smooth experience for both consumer, for both customer and drivers. And all of those concepts are also applying on data platforms. So at Michelin, we have many data platforms. We have one for our secrets, secrets of fabrication of our tires around raw materials. We have one for the services we are providing uh, for fleets. <clears throat> and one, uh, and the most famous one, which is called the corporate data lake, is the one on which we are going to gather pretty much all the useful information that we have at Michelin and to give access to anybody inside the company. So the, the principle we are following the data mesh architecture. So we are putting a storage that you can uh, have on any cloud. And on top of it, we are putting data governance, data quality, data meta catalog with people on, the, on those aspects to act. The storage is split into two parts, a private zone where uh, teams and people can store securely their data and be able to access it without sharing their data to anybody, and a shareable zone on which we are going to have interaction around data products. So around this storage, we are going to create what we are calling feature teams. So a feature team is nothing more than first a group of people which try to achieve a use case. So these people are mainly squads with data engineers, data analysts, data scientists, whatever. And we are giving them a bunch of technical resources which fits to their needs. And those technical resources are isolated. It means that they cannot impact their neighbor. Okay, very important. So this feature team will create a data product on the data lake. So for example, in this case, this team will bring data from the ERP of the company. On the other side, you will have another feature team who will be able to benefit 
from this very first data product that had been provided in the data lake. But they can also bring some data from any system, such as legacies or through API connections with external suppliers. From all of that, we are digging data, visualization, data visualizations, process mining, AI, and everything you want to do with data. And the last step, uh, very important in our use case, is the, on top of it, is the self-service layer. The self-service layer, in fact, we are offering to anybody at Michelin an entry point to be able to access to data easily and securely. So what I'm going to share with you is, is an example on how we've been using that platform in a business context. And, and before going really specifically to the example, I would like just to describe the organization in which this has been happening. Um, maybe some of you or most of you have been working in MNCs or for MNCs. And there is a trend right now going on where we create what you call global business services. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And at Michelin, as we often do, we, we change a little bit the name and we call that corporate business services. So what are we doing within that organization? In fact, we have regrouped four, um, we have re uh, regrouped, sorry, the operations on four key functions of the company. Personnel, so in Michelin, it's important, so it's quite close to our DNA, this part. We don't speak about human resources because very early on, our, uh, our bosses, they said humans are not a resources, humans are humans, people are people. So our HR department is actually called personnel. Uh, and personnel in French means people. Uh, we also run the operations for finance, the record to report process, the operations for purchasing, source to pay process, and order to cash and logistics. Okay, we, we really regrouped the operation for all these four functions of the company. And we have two other functions which are a little bit meta functions, if I can say so. The business process management and the data office. Early on, uh, earlier, uh, Fabien was telling you, you know, at the very top of the previous slide, it was written uh, data organization, data strategy. So the people sitting in the data office are the data owners, the data stewards, and they are basically telling what is the data that should be exposed, what is the data product that should be created, and what kind of value we are targeting. Uh, so six super functions, we have roughly 3,400 uh, 3, people worldwide, and so that's, uh, that's corporate business services. So uh, right now I'm the digital transformer for, the, for that uh, entity, but before I used to work in order to cash, so in the leadership team of order to cash in Europe, and we had a big problem related to data. Concretely, it was like that. Um, I was just learning about the concept of digital transformation. I was really, I didn't really know about it. So originally, I was doing business analysis on enterprise resource planning deployment. And I was just discovering it, so I was attending that presentation, and they said, the data. So, you know, the data is super important. You need to master your data. You need to understand it. You need to be able to show beautiful BI reporting and so on, with lots of cool examples. And I come back to Clermont-Ferrand. Well, that's where our headquarters are. It's a little city south of Paris. And I arrive and I see my boss who is running the operation, enfin, who is coordinating, better said, the order to cash operations in Europe. And they were working with, a, with a, how do you call it, the trainee. And they were working together, you know, just getting data in Excel sheets. They used access stuff. And then they basically, they, they fought in order just to be sure that they have the right data, the right uh, data set. And uh, maybe they spend five, ten percent of the actual time to to work on the insights, to pro propose recommendations, to make decisions. And uh, you know, before that, it was not a problem for me because that's the way we are operating. But when you come back from such a conference about data digital transformation, you get scared. You're like, "Wow, we are so slow. We are so bad. Uh, everything is going to be uh, to be falling apart." And so I went to my boss, I explained, we created a little bit of uh, agitation around that, and we went to meet with the enterprise architect who explained us basically what, what Fabian was telling you. And they proposed us a framework of how we could be leveraging that platform in order to create our value. Now this session is to, called uh, the, um, data democratization, so we need to go to the part where we are democratizing the data, and I'm going to go to that. So, but before that, um, just to tell you how important it is for Michelin. So in order to cash we, and, and logistics in Europe, we were running two, 
two aspects. So the, the Europe replacement market. So if you know a little bit about automotive uh, business, there, is, there are always two markets when you are producing something that needs to go on a car. You have the original equipment, where you create something that is going to be going onto the car on the production line. And then there is a, the replacement market. So for example, your car, you buy your new car. When your tires are used, you need to go change them. And that replacement market is in fact where the money is because uh, you, you need to change your, your tires several times and so. So for Michelin, what does it mean? It's roughly, we, we don't have the exact number and we don't want to share them obviously, but it's roughly 30% of the group turnover. So you saw how many billions we are doing every year. You understand that it's not a piece of cake and this thing needs to run. Two millions of order line, we have seven locations. It's quite a big deal. And what happened is that in this entity, we are, you, we are in transition, but you are still today using a very old legacy system which has been developed in the 90s. And over time, we've lost a little bit the deep understanding of the data and we needed in order to become data driven to, to regain that knowledge, to regain that deep knowledge. So with this operation, leveraging the corporate data lake, we, we, actually, we actually could do that. So what we also wanted to do is, we had this in mind, you know, if you, to, to manage the digital transformation by the book, you need to de-silo the data. I don't know if that's a French translation into English. So basically, instead of having several silos, every, everyone can see all the data. And that was important for us because a lot of people want to consume the order to catch data. And our teams were spending quite a lot of time to make it available to other people. And the last point was the versatility proof. We run operations, they change all the time. The, the system, the underlying systems are changing, but also the way we run our processes. And because that changes, we need also to be able to adapt our data, our data preparation, and our data visualization. And that in the past, in the old way of working, where business was doing one part of the work, IT was doing another part of the work, it was quite difficult to follow the flow. On logistic side, it was a bit simpler. Those guys that just wanted their figures, they wanted to automatize their reporting. They were gathering their data in an unindustrialized way, and they did not want to change that. What they wanted to do is, I want all my data, I take a piece here, a piece here, a piece here. I want everything to be collected in a, in a central place, and I don't want to spend time updating my uh, data visualization. So that was their core thing. So Logistic Europe was more of a quick win. Uh, in Europe replacement, it was a real project where we uh, deployed also some strong, uh, in this, um, some strong architecture. So <clears throat> when we did this, uh, you probably all know uh, there's a question of uh, when you try to create and start data projects, everyone will ask you, okay, what's your ROI? Uh, what is the value that you aim to create with, that, with the money you want to spend? And how can you justify it? And of course, we all also know here that the real value of data is the quality of the decision you are going to make. You are going to save money because you take the right decision. You are going to make mo better money, more money because you will find the right product. But that is always a promise. It's like, okay, if we create the right tools, I'm going to take better decisions, but it's a promise which is quite far away. So in order to spend less time in convincing, what I did is, and I'm also working on automation, I said, you know what? I'm not going to promise you big things about the quality of the decision. I'm just promising you that you are going to spend less effort in allowing people to make them. And we're going to automatize the reporting and make it faster and, and refresh it more often. And based on this, we actually got, got the founding to do our projects, but we did not become, get a big founding. And now I'm getting to that data democratization part. We just got enough to deploy the little bit of, a little bit of infrastructure, but not enough to have 10 people creating reports on, the, on behalf of the business. That was not possible. So yeah, and, and our target also was to, to be great at basic. Of course, we want to go to predictive analysis, to prescriptive analysis, but we also just wanted to be able to do our descriptive analysis based on exposed data and curated data. So the, the, the architecture was, we want to automatize recurrent charts, uh, we want to facilitate ad hoc analysis, and want to be able to support experimentation based on data. You know, I'm sitting in business and very often, I had my, my AI guys coming to me and saying, hey, we have that supplier. They want to do a collaborative, uh, the, the collaborative um, uh, exploration with us. We don't have to pay anything. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't work with them because we do not have the data. So having that curated data in place was uh, allowing us also to see some opportunity from time to time to do some exploration with people who gave us some means. 
main components storage in a centralized way, and we use also other tooling, like Databricks, like others, to automatize the update of recurrent reporting. And now comes the shift, that data democratization I, will, I, was, I want to talk with you about. In fact, what we do is that we operate a shift in the way and in the, the responsibility of who is working on the data, and specifically on the transformation of data. So if I take the I, I under, my understanding is that is a Databricks way of talking, the, the bronze, silver, and gold data. So I, I created that slide before and without the source and aggregated fit for purpose. My understanding is that we create the data in an information system. We extract it, so we expose it. We transform it into uh, some, some models that can be useful for ourselves, sorry, and for others. And then we do the data visualization. And the key thing, what I was observing in previous projects is that as when we had a, the normal share of work where business was expressing or specifying requirements and IT was delivering the data transformation, is that the people who were hired to do the data transformation, they did not know our business data and they did not know our processes. So basically, your business, you say, I would like to do this. Ah, okay. So can you explain me the information system where the data is? Can you tell me where the data sets are? And can you explain the process? If I know all of that, why do I need you? Because the only thing what is actually missing is the capacity to go and to do the code. Why don't we try and let the business learn that? That's what we did. And that's the biggest step, in fact, of the data democratization. We allowed business to go into more technical layers and to try doing what they usually did in Excel because they, they do this kind of super complex analysis. They just do it in the tools they know, Excel and Access. So we translated that. We said, if you're able to think about it, design it, then probably if we give you a little bit of support, you should be able to do that in a more technical layers like Databricks. And for the data visualization, you, you all know that Power BI is quite an accessible tool. And that shift was brilliant. So it was really, it was like, when we allowed the first business expert users to enter into, uh, into Databricks, they started learning, in fact, super fast. We realized that they were not telling it to IT, but for a long time, they got themselves some backend accesses and they were running SQL queries in the shadow IT mode since a long time. So they did not talk about it because they didn't want those accesses to be closed, but they were there. They had that knowledge. So in fact, it was just giving them, allowing them, in fact, to use their knowledge for the benefit of Mishnah. And that's, in fact, the, the key point of the data democratization we want to share with you today. So what, has, what have been the key learnings? Uh, so the first one, I don't know, for the IT people, you don't understand what I'm talking about, but the business people, I'm sure you do. You know, when you see in the movies, the hackers, you know, they are entering a code into some uh, prompt screens. For us, that's science fiction. You are able to do that, you're a superhero. And thinking that we, as business persons, we can actually try doing that, and, and with a little bit of explanation, we can do simple stuff. It's quite cool. We feel good about it, and we feel empowered. And it's a fear, in fact, that is being beaten. And, and the conclusion was that, yes, sorry for the IT people, sorry for you, Fabian, Business can create quick and they can do it fast, but usually they are not good, they are not efficient. And that's where IT comes into play because the IT expert, the technical leadership can come and help us improving it, consume less computation power, execute faster, you know, doing it in a better way and also document it because as business, you know, once, once the thing is running, it exists, no problem. We don't really think that somebody else needs to support it and you need to, to make, create an organization around the product to have it running on the long term. So that's where IT is helping us. And in fact, that collaboration with this little shift of responsibility makes the whole thing faster, cheaper, and more versatile. We are more resilient because we have business people there at the core. They, they get every change that is happening and they can translate that into changes into the data product. And that makes it closer to what you actually need and helping us to generate more value. So that was my part. That was the experience sharing I wanted to share with you about the business part where we got, when we started, in fact, to use some more technical layers. And that's how we achieved that uh, democratization of usage of data. And now over to Fabien. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you because I've heard yeah, you need IT guys. So it means at least half of this room have some jobs for, the, for a couple of weeks, 
uh, of years at least. And that's good. Uh, um, who is the guy with the yellow uh, jacket here? Uh, that's me, right? Uh, in fact, I, I thought I told you to put your yellow hoodie today, but apparently you forgot. I forgot it. Uh, OK, so if you don't mind, uh, for this context, you will have the yellow hoodie, but I'm pretty sure uh, in the next future you will be able to wear the, the, the sky blue boots. Um, in fact, IT is listening to the growth of data citizen. But we're really convinced that you cannot just say to business users that, OK, you have access to self-service cluster in Databricks. Let's go. No, it, it won't work. It won't work at all if we don't do with them the very first steps, in fact, to, to, to help them, or at least to show how to access to the data properly, how to perform basic transformation of the data, and after, we are, let's say, starting the wheel and they, they can run by their own. And why we, we came to that conclusion? Because we, we think that it's not so easy for a Lambda user to, uh, to create a Power BI report connected to its data curated by a Datadrix uh, notebook, updated each and every day, shared with his friend, um, and we, we made quite a game uh, to identify all the steps that were required to achieve this goal. And uh, yeah, so uh, sounds quite complicated. And the, the, at the opposite, for IT guys like me, it's my day-to-day -day job, so I can explain very fluently to anybody that he needs to go to all those administrative steps. I can send them the, the links to, to, to achieve that in a couple of minutes and they will be able to do. But if they do it on their own, it could take up to two to three months because they are lost in somewhere in the void, I don't know. So I'd like to share with you today um, a story, the, my story. Uh, so we need to go back a little bit at COVID time. Uh, I was working with a lady at the purchase department and this lady uh, was working on market intelligence so she was following, you know, the market evolution of the prices of the community we were buying at Michelin. So at Michelin, we are very happy if we can buy stuff uh, at a price lower than the market because we save money. And in fact, she was managing like a forest of Excel sheets. Uh, so does anybody in the room know at least somebody who managed uh, data like that uh, having a, okay, you are not alone. Uh, so she was spending most of her time retrieving the data from the supplier sites, from her personal mailbox, and she was aggregating the data into, guess what? A big Excel sheet that we were sharing uh, with our internal customer into a shared folder before the data lake to our internal customer. And her, internal customer were creating reporting on it, also on Excel, uh, that they were sending to their internal customer. So you can easily imagine in this context that if you have any data quality issue, uh, the boomerang quickly goes back to the left, to that poor lady that, it's sad, but she has absolutely no lever because she rely on the data that she, extract, uh, she extracts from the system. So what we did, a few moments later, uh, what I did with her was to first uh, automatize the data retrieving. And that's why quite a good step. Uh, thanks to Databricks, uh, we, we have implemented API call to retrieve the data automatically on a daily basis. We have built like a, a backbone table in which we were putting all the data in it, and I have shown her how to use Power BI, and she, uh, yeah, she upskills herself on Power BI, and she, the, the dashboard that you are seeing on the, at the very bottom, it's, uh, it's her who has created those, and she is serving all our communities like that. 
And she is, in fact, saving a lot of time because she can now focus on the data analysis instead of spending tremendous amount of time in the data retrieval. So at the end of such coaching phase, we need to capture our feeling. Was it good? Was it not good? What can we improve? What do we need to, what do we need to keep? What would, do we need to replace? Because as IT, we don't do stuff just for fun. We need to have a, a clear uh, return on investment on what we do. At the very end, uh, I think we are having benefits for both sides. First, on IT side, um, you know, we, we all have the image of the IT people uh, locked in the basement of the building, uh, answering to customers like, uh, have you tried to turn it off and on again? And it should work. Uh, no, we, if, we, if we act as coach, in fact, we are leveraging uh, ourselves to be more communicative, effective, we also better understand businesses and why we do uh, what we do. Uh, and it's also opportunities for IT guys to get some fresh air on their day-to-day -day job because, in fact, uh, no offense, uh, it's basic stuff that we do with, b with business people. We are not building a, an entire ERP of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the company. We are performing classical data curation and, uh, and reporting. And on business side, um, in fact, she can grow up on data technology. She better understand IT and our constraints. So the next time uh, we'll say no to any, uh, let's say, eccentric requests, she might understand better. Uh, and the good, uh, last point, uh, she can reshare on knowledge. But if in an organization you take one people and you upskill these people, it quickly comes into the spotlight and it becomes Neo in Matrix uh, for our colleagues. Like, wow, what a, <laughs> it's amazing what you are doing to do. Even if, <laughs> even if she has a, 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 a Databricks notebook open with some coding inside for business users, you, you are killing them. So all of that um, aims to democratize the usage of our data at Michelin. Uh, once again, this shift where businesses can take over activities historically managed by IT, in fact, brings value faster to the company. I think it's over. Uh, maybe, well, maybe what you can say is that, yes, it brings faster value to the business, and we are more empowered with our data. But I think it also provides a new dimension to the role of the IT within the business community because they are associated also with the business outcome of what they are building. So they are closer to the business. They understand better the why of their activity. And that's often a quite a, a motivation factor. And, uh, and it's probably a more, uh, uh, they, they feel more valuable by providing coaching than by doing the stuff by themselves somewhere. Working together with the business, accompanying them in their, uh, in their ramping up is also a quite, um, I would say it's a good experience for our IT community. So thank you. If you have any question, we'll be very happy to answer. And thank you for listening. <laughs>